your uh, devices are silent, that would be terrific. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the library. Thank you so much for joining us here. Events like this are made possible with contributions from our members and friends. And tonight we'd like to uh, especially thank Richard Peck for his generous support of this event and all of our children's and young adult events. This past summer, I was delighted when Carol handed me an advanced reader copy of her new book. I dove right in. I began reading it on my commute home. And in fact, I was so sucked into the story that I missed my stop. <laughs> this is a true story. It absolutely happened. So yes, that is how much I enjoyed Speed of Life. So I'm thrilled to introduce Carol Weston. She is a teacher an advice columnist, and the author of 16 books, including her latest, and first entry into the world of young adult literature, Speed of Life. So please join me in welcoming Carol tonight. Thank you, Randy. Thank you all for coming tonight. I so appreciate it. And it's, it's just wonderful to see you all and to meet you. Um, so I am, it's funny, when I speak in other places, I always start with I'm a New Yorker, and everyone's already impressed. <laughs> Sadly, that doesn't work here, but I usually then say, and I talk really fast, uh, which is kind of helpful. So my plan is to talk fairly fast as I zoom through my PowerPoint. Then we have the special treat of uh, Kristen Condon is going to read uh, just a couple pages of the book, but she read the audio book, and, and Speed of Life, indeed, is my 16th book, but my first audio book, so it's just very cool for me that she is here. Usually, I read it, and that's fine, but wait till you hear her read it. Um, okay, I write both fiction and nonfiction. I come from a family of writers that's me with my big brothers, that's me, and that kind of sums up my relationship with my dad. My dad and my mom were both writers. My dad got a Peabody and did radio and television and, um, and newspapers. And my mom was the garden editor of House and Garden magazine. Um, when I learned to write, I kept a diary and I wrote about writing. So unlike many young people who read books at night, I was one of these kids who just kind of wrote in a diary. I didn't have very much to say, but confidence was very high. <laughs> so I wrote, and I buy my lunch at school. The menu was pizza, and it was good. <laughs> well, yes, at school we learned to write Z and Y in scripted. So now I've learned every letter in scripted except for the letters B, C, E, F, H, K, <laughs> R, S, T. Of course, I know every letter. <laughs> um, when I do visit schools, I say, how many of you keep journals? And I tell them how important it is to keep a journal, not just if you want to find your voice as a writer, and that's really helpful, but just if you want to stay sane, because we have so much in our heads, and if you write in a diary, you have a place to put what you're going through, and how your day was, and whether you're mad at somebody, or wishing for something, and it's just such a, it's like therapy. And I also think it helps you become a better observer, so if you, at any stage and age, I think it's great to keep a journal, it doesn't have to be every day. Um, my first book, Girl Talk, came out in 1985 and is in print in many languages. I know my editor, Janet Goldstein, is, is she here? Is Janet? Janet's there! Hi, Janet! <laughs> Janet, uh, this book came out in 1985. The fact that it is still in print is kind of a wonderful miracle. I still get letters from Russian, Latvia, and Bulgaria, and from kids uh, that, it's, that it's helped. So it's, so it's, it's wonderful that Janet and I worked together, and we worked together so long ago that uh, we ended up like sitting down breastfeeding next to each other. <laughs> I still think that was a business meeting, sort of. But, um, kids the same age. So, but maybe my first book was in fifth grade. It was called The Story of My Life. Again, I had nothing of interest to say, but I tried to say it with Blair. Chapter two, almost two. <laughs> Um, I still like to write and rewrite until I get it right. And um, this is my cat, our cat, since Robert's in the room, and Annie, our cat. Uh, my office looking pretty 
clean, I'd say. I, I now have a new desk because that whole thing fell. That whole bookshelf fell. And so I had to do such a cleanup, but it was a good thing. Sometimes that's a good thing. But even today, I mean, talk about sloppy copy. I always write, at some point it just, I print, and it comes out on nice white paper. And then months, months later, when I think I've worked hard and done a whole lot of changes, I'll print it on, say, blue paper, because then I'm saying to myself, this is, this is, this is a draft, this is a draft. And then I'll change it a lot, and then I'll put it on, say, yellow paper. So this is what I did today. This was the yellow paper. It's already supposed to be pretty darn good. But I had all these other ideas that I think were pretty good. So now I just keep making lots of drafts. I wish I were a writer who, who it all came pouring out perfectly, but I read a lot about other writers, and I think that's a myth. So the fact <laughs> that, um, that Hemingway worked um, that last page of A Farewell to Arms and did it, I think, 39 times. I'm like, 39 times. That's, that's kind of part of the course. Maybe that's a lot, but that's somehow not shocking. All right, so sloppy copy. Girls Life asked me to be an advice columnist way back in 1994. When I said yes, I had no idea that that magazine would still be going all these years later because a lot of magazines like Jump and Sassy and J14 and or maybe they're still alive. <laughs> it's hard to stay. It's hard to stay afloat. So it's been kind of wonderful that 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 gig has kept on going. I used to get a lot of snail mail, and I still get snail mail, but I get more email from girls. And sometimes it's just, I have a crush, and should I tell them? And sometimes, way too often, it's something extremely heavy. So when people say, Carol, how do you stay knowing what it's like to be a 12-year-old? I think I never really got out of knowing what it was like to be a 12-year-old. <laughs> and when I had daughters, you know, I had daughters, and I saw what they were doing. And and with the letters, it's just uh, a way to stay, to just stay in that world. Um, so, but then I had to give some myself some advice because a while back, when I was pushing 40, my husband Rob, Exhibit A over here, <laughs> would notice that every time we went to a cocktail party and people would say, and what do you do? I would say, oh, I am you know, wrote a book called Girl Talk and I'm an advice columnist, but I really want to write a novel. And Robert would just go, you can't, that cannot be your answer year after year. <laughs> so I went to the New Year's Eve party that year and I decided I'd be brave and I'd make a resolution. And my resolution was this year, this year I'm going to write a novel. So that was a big moment for me. And then the next year we went back to Alan Fishman's wonderful New Year's Eve party and there was Vogue, it was so glamorous. And my friend Laura, who I knew from high school, said, are you going to make a resolution? I said, yes, I'm going to write a novel. Yeah. And she said, you said that last year. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was honestly shocked. So I got some therapy. <laughs> and I said, why can't I write a novel or, or not care? Like, if I care, let's do this. And he said, tell me about your mother. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and my mother, who had you know, a pretty glorious career, but she was kind of a novelist and maybe poet monk, and she had wanted to write a novel. And uh, so I sort of inherited the dream and the nightmare, but um, he was very helpful. And then I took a course at the Y. And it, New York is amazing, because I actually was lucky enough to you know, go to Yale and major in French and Spanish comparative literature. I was well-educated, but you go to New York, and you go to the Y, and you take a class, like, how to write a novel, and it's Alice Elliott Dark teaching, and she's amazing, and so I wrote a novel that never made it out of the drawer, but then I wrote some more novels that got rejected by everybody in town except Knopf. And Knopf said, why, this is a lovely manuscript, and gave me $10,000 for the diary of Melanie Martin, and then I kept going. I kind of wanted, Truth told to just take Melanie around the world to France and Japan and Mexico and everywhere. But he, she, she probably rounded in uh, book four. But it was such a fun ride to travel with Melanie. And I know in my advice for writers, no matter what you're writing, is try to figure out what you can bring to the party. I knew that if there's a, a smorgasbord, the only thing I know how to cook is chocolate chip cookies. Rob is such a good cook. But I am not. But if it's a literary kind of smorgasbord, what can I bring to the party? Well, I knew I, you know, I knew I could speak languages and that I really like art. So the middle school art teacher in these books, the, the, 
the alter ego for me in these books was the was a middle school art teacher, and she was always taking the kids to museums, but she would get telling them stuff, and they'd be playing, um, point out the naked people and laughing, and she, but you'd be learning stuff, and it was lots of fun to write these books. Whenever I'm speaking to, like last week, you know, 750 middle school kids in Vernon Center Middle School, and I always like to say, hay alguien aquí que habla español, or ya que alguien se equipa el francés, because if you suddenly switch the languages, these kids are like, whoa, and I tell them I'm, I'm a word nerd, it's not, it's not just English. It's words. Um, so, the next series, and I'm so happy that Steve Geck is in the house. He's the editorial director of children's books at Sourcebook Jabberwocky, and he said yes to the Avon Pip series. It was also really nice of you, Steve, when you bought Avon Pip to say we'd like to do a two book deal. I couldn't believe that nobody had done that ever because I just felt like, thank you for the vote of confidence. So then, Avon Taco Cat was. Just such fun to write as well, based on our cat who used to, who was a rescue cat and used to just hide under the, under the sofa. And uh, is now such a sweetheart. Anyway, so the Ava series was born. Um, Ava and Pip, it's loosely based on my real life. My mom may or may not have paid a little more attention to my brother. <laughs> Don't tell you guys. <laughs> so Ava was like this really good kid. And so was Pip, but Pip was so shy, so the parents were always worrying about Pip, and Ava was like, what about me? So I ended up writing this book in which Ava has to figure out a way to help her sister find her voice, and in doing so, she finds her own. Um, so Ava likes palindromes, mom, dad, taco cat, kayak, huh? Wow. And I always tell uh, school kids, this should be your takeaway, or at least one, dog do? Good God. <laughs> um, so Victoria Jameson, Steve asked her to do the cover. She did Ava and Pip. And that's me, by the way, around that same age. So it's kind of amazing to me that Victoria could find me in these words, because there I am, pip like upside down. But then she's uh, gone on to get a Newberry Honor book, so um, Honor oh, nominee. So that was, no, to get a Newberry Honor. So that was very cool. Milton Glaser once did a cover from here in the maternity of the book of mine, so that was cool too. And the New York Times said nice things. And they said, I perfectly captured the complexities of sisterhood. And that's because I have a daughter, Emmy, who has a sister, Lizzie. So whenever they were having a fight, instead of just saying, stop that, children, I would get out my pen and write everything they said down. <laughs> and then I would say, stop that. <laughs> um, so Vanity Fair nicely called Taco Cat Perfect. I am forever grateful and I love that book and love the picture that a kid sent me. Um, sometimes Mike helps me, sometimes he gets in the way. <laughs> That's actually Rob's laptop. Um, so they say don't judge a book by its cover, but people do. And I worked so hard on Speed of Life, which I'm going to tell you about, that when um, Steve sent us these completely lovely covers. My agent and I do did what my agent and I do, which is that we conferred on the phone. She always says, don't, don't say, I love it. Talk to me, we're gonna talk first. So I said, so with Ava and Pip, I said, I love it. Um, with these, I said, I, I like it. And she said, yeah, me too, I don't love it. So she likes to be the bad guy, so she calls Steve and says, oh, we aren't happy, because I'm always like, it's great, thank you just for publishing me. So it's, it's good that she did, this is why people need agents. You can have it for free. <laughs> um, so then they came up with this cover, which I think is much cuter, it's actually yellow on the, on the back there. And that's Emmy's cat, and Chris's cat, I always do this at, at middle schools everywhere. Um, this is sort of amazing, back when that bookshelf fell down a couple months ago, and I had to do a lot of cleaning up I didn't feel like doing, I found this piece of paper that says 2007, that is 10 years ago. But I guess I outlined that book 10 years ago. So in January, it says, take down the tree. And indeed, this book, one of the very first chapters is, the book starts on January 1st, and one of the very first chapters is the dad takes down the tree with Sophia, who was 14, with her help. The mom had died eight months sooner, so they had a horrible Christmas. And then, now they have to undecorate. 
And I just really liked the idea of writing about that because every holiday, you know, Thanksgiving's coming, we have fun decorating, the place smells delicious, you know, Christmas, you put out the stockings, but then there's always the undecorating, and you don't see that as much in, or almost at all, in, you know, TV movies and books. And I really wanted to start the book with the undecorating, that, you know, Christmas came anyway, even though life was terrible for this family. So it's, and I also like the idea that each chapter was going to be um, a, m a month, so it's not chapter one, chapter two, it's January through uh, December. But it's extraordinary to me that this idea came in 2007. And I, I can't tell you that I worked on it for 10 years, although I did, but it's not like I only did that. I mean, I did the Ava and Pip series came out in the middle of, of that time. I, raised two fine daughters, I lived my life, I worked on other stuff, lots of essays, but I just never gave up on this book. I will say that I probably let it out of the bag a little too soon, which sometimes writers do. I love getting feedback, and I um, think it's important, really important to get as much intelligent, kind feedback as you can get. So I start with Robert's mother, she's 93, and she always says, this wonder. I don't know how you do it. And that's all I need in the big one. That's all I need. And I always end with Robert. He's like person 20 because he'll be, I mean, he'll, if I don't do this myself, he'll do it. You know? So, um, but it's still helpful. I don't take everything he says, but I take a lot. It's helpful. And helpful to him as well. He's a playwright. Anyway, so I really believe in feedback. I think I probably let the book out of the bag too soon. It got a bunch of rejections. But some of the rejections were helpful because sometimes they would say, you set up this gigantic fight and then you made them all sort of kiss and make up too quickly. Well, that's because I'm an advice columnist. So I sort of excel at fixing the fights instead of making the fights go longer and longer. Um, so I had to learn how to make the fights go to a head. Anyway, it was absolutely wonderful when Steve, um, when we already had the Aven Pip thing go and said, you know, I, I, I now sent him a, a, an improved manuscript, a, a much, much stronger manuscript. And he, he liked it, and he took it, and then it got four-star reviews, which was so exciting. And Publishers Weekly invited me to their star review party on December 3rd, and I'm like, I look at my calendar going, please be free, yes, I'm free. <laughs> I'm going to a star review party. I didn't even know they had star review parties. <laughs> Um, anyway, the New York Times said it was perceptive and funny and moving new novels, so that was very cool. Do you like audiobooks? This is part of my PowerPoint. Kristen Condon plays Sophia Sand for Kate Abuelo and all the characters. And she even came to our house after we realized, oh no, I guess we wanted to be sure you could handle the Spanish, because it's not just Spanish, it's Castilian Spanish. Um, Sophia is half Española. And she can handle it beautifully, but she was also wonderful about letting Robert and me sort of tell her when to list and when not, and just be clear about that. So it's fun to meet my readers, girls and boys. I like this girl when she's in the swim togs. You know? <laughs> That's kind of fun. Um, and and I like meeting other authors. So Colson Whitehead, Tony Doerr. I read his book, All the Light We Cannot See, in, in manuscript form before it got any, not manuscript form, in the arc before it got any reviews, and I thought, this, this is literature. That was so exciting. And here's my mom at Agnes Scott College, and she met Robert Frost. So, and then here are my kids, Emmy, it's a palindrome, E M M E, and Lizzie, and that's Judy Bloom. Yeah. So, um, in my website, there's the Hall of Fame photos where I have a shameless amount of photos. <laughs> um, so now I'd like to read to you, but really Kristen is going to do that, and answer your questions. And this is, by the way, Margarita from Las Meninas. But microphone, right? Come on up, Kristen. Hello. I'm so glad that you persevered with this book. It's just so beautiful, and I'm so honored to have been a part of it in the audiobook form. I've done a bunch of them, and this is one that really, really touched me. I guess I, I had a lot of change as well um, in my preteen years, so. All right, let's begin. Warning. This is kind of a sad story, at least at first. So if you don't like sad stories, maybe you shouldn't read this. I mean, I'd understand if you put it down and watch cat videos instead. I like cat videos, too. 
then again, this book is already in your hands. It starts and ends on January 1st, and I was thinking of calling it The Year My Whole Life Changed, or Life, Death, and Kisses, or maybe even The Year I Grew Up. For me, being 14 was hard, really hard. Childhood was a piece of cake. Being a kid in New York City and spending summers in Spain, that was all pretty perfect looking back. But being 14 was like climbing a mountain in the rain, in flip-flops. <laughs> I hoped I'd wind up in a different place, but I kept tripping and slipping and falling and wishing it weren't way too late to turn around. This book does have funny parts, and I learned two giant facts. Number one. Everything can change in an instant, for worse, for sure, but also for better. Number two, sometimes if you just keep climbing, you get an amazing view. You see what's behind you and what's ahead of you, and the big surprise, what's inside you. Dirt, pebbles, rocks, my knees, my shoulder, my head. Someone was moaning. Whoa, whoa, was I moaning? Were those moans coming from me? What was going on? Someone was cradling my head saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Kate's voice, she was stroking my hair but her fingertips felt wet. Why were her fingertips wet? Has someone called 911? An ambulance is on the way. Can somebody call her father? Kate's voice again. What's his number? I don't have my cell. 917, 917, 917. He works at Mount Sinai. Greg Wolf. Can someone get a hold of him? Kate sounded so upset. I wanted to tell them my father's number, and I tried to say it out loud, but no words came, just, ow, ow, ow. Everything hurt. I opened my eyes, closed them, opened them again. A woman was hugging Sam. Sam, I forgot about Sam. Who was hugging Sam? A siren, louder, closer, a streak of blurry red. The smell of burning rubber. An ambulance? Two men rushed toward me. It was like on TV. Who were they? Parachuters? Paramedics? What happened? We were biking, Sam's voice. She must have hit a patch of gravel, or maybe she used the wrong brake. She went flying over the handlebars. When she hit the ground, she started shaking. Sam's voice was shaking. Where's the girl's mother? A man asked. I wanted to tell him about my mother, and I tried, but ah, no words. A person above me was attaching something plastic to my neck. Her mother died this last year, Kate said. This was true, but I wanted to shout, she did not, or at least say something else about my mother. Didn't anyone ever want to know anything about my mother besides that she died? Was I dying too? Was this what it felt like? A fuzzy quiet fading away? I'm dating her father, Kate said, her voice strange and high. Is she going to be okay? Who, me? Why wouldn't I be okay? We'll do everything we can. Two people lifted me onto a stretcher, strapped me down. Be careful, Kate's voice. Ma'am, step out of the way. Let us do our job. They slid me onto their ambulance as if I were a loaf of bread going into an oven. Another man's voice. Okay, come with us, quick, get in front. A door slammed, sirens blared, a woman, a nurse, was next to me. A man was talking. The driver? Valhalla isn't the closest hospital, but it's the best place for head trauma. Valhalla? Like, in mythology? <laughs> Wasn't that where heroes went when they died? Kate's voice was husky. Sophia, I'm with you. I'm up front. You had a bite.
bike accident, but you're going to be okay. An accident? Oh no, is the bike okay? <laughs> hey, that sounded like my voice. Sweetheart? Kate sounded so relieved. Yes, it's fine, and, and you'll be fine too. The same words popped out. Oh no, is the bike okay? Alexa would kill me if I wrecked her bike. <laughs> it's fine, how do you feel? Kate's voice. Oh no, my voice again. Is the bike okay? <laughs> yes, it's fine, no worries. Now Kate sounded worried. Why did she sound worried? Keep her talking, a person next to me said. Keep her awake, I have the IV ready in case she needs anesthesia meds. I was so tired, so tired. I'd never been so tired. Kate kept talking to me and the driver started talking. Alone? <laughs> he sounded far away, very far away. 14 year old girl, possible brain injury, contact seizure, bicycle accident, brief loss of consciousness, convulsions, cuts and abrasions on head, shoulder, elbow, knees, Kate's voice again. I remember his number. Then softly, Greg, listen, Sophia was in a back bike accident. We're in an ambulance going to the Westchester Medical Center. She's talking. Meet us there. Drive carefully or get a cab. I don't have my cell with me, but I'll call again as soon as I know anything. Oh, I get it. Kate was calling my dad. She should call my mom, too. Oh, wait. Close my eyes again. I wanted to sleep. I needed to sleep. 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 Let's, let's take the show on the road. <laughs> That's amazing. You got me choked up, and I know what's going to happen. <laughs> That scene was a little bit based on, or very much based on, a bike accident that uh, Lizzie had, and, and it all worked out. But I was very glad in the ER when somebody said that if someone has a head trauma and they repeat the same thing over and over and over, it might work out. Because that was pretty scary. <laughs> that was amazing. I can't believe how it No wonder you do this professionally. <laughs> all right. Um, questions, and maybe you have questions for Kristen too. Maybe somebody wants to grab the books. Anyway, questions. Please ask questions. Yes? How many times did you write that chapter? That chapter? You know, that first one, The Warning, which is the first book, the first sentence of the whole book, The Warning, um, that I wrote, honestly, 30 times. You know, this is a kind of sad story. Whereas the chapter of uh, that Kristen just read, I probably only rewrote a little bit. That one did come out pretty pretty much the way I want it to be. But this whole book started out four points of view. It started out the dear Sophia, who said, Alexa, who doesn't want a stepsister, and their two, and the, a mother and a father. And then I knocked it down to just two points of view, the two girls, but it was third person. And then Knopf said, why don't you try it first person? So I did. And then they said, why don't you try it first person, just one character? So I did, and then they said no, and that was two years. <laughs> However, it was so much of a better book, that, and I was so disgusted to put it in the drawer, but then when I got back, because sometimes you just need to let your work sit there, but usually you don't have that opportunity. So when I then got back to this way better book and worked on it some more, and Steve had some thoughts too, it was sort of for the greater good, but at the time, it was definitely like a just shoot me now kind of situation. <laughs> um, more questions? Yes, Sarah. Is the title actually David Bowie reference? It is not. Oh, gosh, it's almost embarrassing to realize that I didn't quite realize that I was Googling the title. Oh, you know. oh, it's a great album. Everybody go listen to it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny with titles because even from here in maternity, my book at the time, there was a book that came out that, had, that nurses had worked on called From Here to Maternity. And I love that title. And uh, we, I think we didn't even know it, about it, but I mean, I was running around doing the Phil Donahue show and Montel and Today and all this stuff. And meanwhile, there was another book that was probably getting a little, you know, a little 
lives as well. There's another teen book out there called Speed of Life that came out sooner, but sometimes you just say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> you said you did an outline in 2007. What did that look like? I thought you told me you kind of don't like outlines. Well, it literally looked at, like what you said, so it wasn't much of an outline. It was just that it was January, February, March. So in other words, a, yeah. it was literally what you said. I like outlines because there are three people here in my in my uh, writing class because I teach. I love teaching at this library once a month, and I have the most wonderful students. And Christopher is one of them. I guess I shouldn't say out loud that he's working on. I won't. I won't. Glad that didn't happen. <laughs> but anyway, so we've done, so it's, I mean, I like the idea of outlines. If I thought I could outline and the book would be better, I would totally do it. But in this case, the outline was more like January, February. I knew I wanted a kid that started out, her life was terrible and now they were undecorated, you know. And I knew at the end it was going to be a Christmas scene where things were a whole lot happier. Because as I always say, it's a children's book. It's going to, you know, there's going to be at least somewhat uplifting. But um, some people say, too, that you don't want to know every little bit. E.L. Dr. O, I love what he said. He says it's like driving at night. You need to know your destination. You need to know you're, you know, you're going to Detroit, but he, this was before GPSs. You didn't need to know every little byway. You just kind of had to know the direction, had your head beams on. Um, but you do have to know the trajectory, I guess, like beginning, middle, and end. Bad things have to happen. You don't necessarily, it's not really the little boat going down the river where you're throwing coconuts at the boat, but it is a little. I mean, that, that bike scene, which happened in real life, and which I was able to shoehorn into the book because you kind of want to make things worse for your character, even though you feel terrible, for, terrible about it. And even though you're a dear Carol, like Girls Like Magazine, and try to make things better for girls. But in fiction, you have to make it bad. Put them through some ringers. I, I was just going to ask about the, the how, how is it writing the, um, the darker emotions? Is that something that you've done before, or is that sort of new for this? Because it's so great. Oh, thank you. Well, this is, I guess, the first YA book. So, um, so you know, Ava and Pip goes dark, but not that dark or lonely. I mean, bad things happen to the characters. You know, they lose their luggage, or their, their best friendship is in jeopardy, or stuff like that, but it's not like, the mom died, you know. So this is way darker. And um, you know, back in probably 2007 or eight, when I was beginning to work on the book, the other scene that you were that we were thinking of that you might read about the tree, the tree scene, I wrote that honestly. It was the 25th anniversary of uh, the day that my dad had died, which is April 7th. Her mom died. The mom dies April 7th. And I was like, Are you kidding me? I still don't get my dad back. Like. 25 years, give me back my dad, you know? So I was writing, I'm not gonna let this happen. I was writing and I'm typing away, and I'm, I always have gum, you know, it's better than smoking. So I'm typing away and the gum falls on my keypad. Like I'm just weeping it, you know? So sometimes it is hard, but if you write something like that, you know, don't, don't go crossing out that one too much. Like if you write a dark scene and you're viscerally involved too, that's, you know, you still gotta fix it, but don't change too many things. So it was hard, but it was also, I guess, cathartic because, you know, I had a place to put all these feelings, you know. And also I get letters from girls who say, you know, dear Carol, my, my mom died three months ago and my friends were really nice about it, but they don't understand why I'm still sad, and I am still sad. When will I get over it? Oh honey, you're not gonna get over it. You know, you'll get through it. So that's I mean, I wrote it, I guess, for me, because writers write for themselves a lot, but I also wrote it because I knew a lot of kids kind of needed, needed a big old hug. But I wanted it to be funny, too, because I wanted kids who, God forbid, they have to go through anything like that, but they could uh, just be, you know, be empathetic, know what someone else may be going through. Right. On a lighter note, perhaps, um, if we were to sort of take a, a look in your handbag, would there any be any scribbled Uh, well, we know that I'm working on Margarita right now. <laughs> um, I mean, you still write notes. Oh, I right still always down. do, yes. Everybody, you just you just always do. Tom Wolf is a member of this beautiful library that Edith Wharton and Willa Cather and 
Alexander Hamilton and Herman Melville borrowed books from him. Tom Wolfe borrows books from him here too. He, he, um, but he said he just, every time he goes to a dinner party, he does at the very least, just a little white piece of paper and a little pen. You know, you don't have to have a whole laptop with you. But if you're a writer, you better have a pen with you. And actually, one thing that, that therapist said years ago is that you have to honor your work. I mean, if you have an idea, you might not have time to turn everything into a book or even a picture book or a poem or anything, but if you don't write stuff down, you're, you're kidding yourself. So even if it's a, on just a scrap of paper, you still have to write it down. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Bob? Sure. Uh, how often do you hear from boys? Um, well, I'm glad you asked. When I give talks at co-ed schools, most of the, I mean, I just spoke at Hewitt and Nightingale in the past month, but I often just start, speak at co-ed schools too, and I always tell the boys that we've given them diaries for girls, like Avon Pip is a diary for girls. And I always say, um, so basically, if you get my book, you can read a diary of a girl, and then I say, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I also say that girls never need permission to read Harry Potter, you know? That said, Girl Talk is a book for girls, and um, but I'm happy that a lot of boys do, you know, have read Speed of Life or have been, um, because because it's a book about a person, you know. Um, yes, ma'am. So a lot of your books, or most of your uh, books, have been based on some of your own experiences. You've sprinkled them throughout. Uh, what is it like now? I know you were not alive in 1656. I was not. <laughs> so what, how is that different doing uh, fiction that's based on your own life versus fiction that's really, truly based on research? Yeah, that's an amazing question. I don't think I really thought, I think I will write a historical fictional memoir for young people. That's kind of the genre, and it didn't occur to me, you know, let's do Girl with the Pearl Earring for, for <laughs> young people. But um, I have always loved this, this painting, Las Meninas, which is in Madrid, and, and this girl, and I'm not alone, but I feel like maybe there are not too many people who love this painting in Velasquez as, as much as I do, and you know and care about girls as much as I do. So. You know, the subset kind of made sense. Like, once I suddenly had the idea of telling this girl's story, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, and actually, Matt's, uh, Matt's, Matt's, somewhere, Matt's partner, Matt, came over one day for Easter, and somehow we got on the last, because I think we have a coffee table book, and he started talking about this painting, and he knew a few things about it that I didn't know, and I was like, Wow, there's so much more to find out. And he said, and then she becomes an empress. And I didn't know she became an empress. I just knew she was a princess. So the main difference is you go into this gigantic rabbit hole of research. Because if I'm writing Avon Pip, I have to research palindromes. Or you know, if I'm writing Speed of Life, it really is more internal. But for something like, uh, like might be called Girl in the Painting, um, depending on what Steve thinks, because Ava and Pip was going to be called, Ava read it in Magic Pen, and the first time we met each other, we had lunch, like within 60 seconds, it was like, so nice to meet you, and he said, I don't think we like the title, I'm like, okay, <laughs> and he said, how about Ava and Pip, and I said, I like Ava and Pip, anyway, so it might not be Girl in the Fame thing, but you, you pointed out that Ava read it in Magic Pen sounded like a picture book, which of course it does, but, so Ava and Pip was better. <laughs> This book is requiring a whole ton of research. So for instance, I just went to the Frick to look at the Murillo that they have and to ponder what it was like to be a golden age painter in Seville. And it turned out Murillo, this other important painter, was orphaned at age 10. And she would have met Murillo at age eight. And so I wrote a scene today, it's just a tiny scene, but where she's sort of thinking about that. Um, she just has a lot of loss in her young life, so it's something I can, write about, but there's also stuff I can't, I have to just research. And um, one of our friends, Basco, who is a painter, she helped me a little bit with like paints and pigments and how do you stir them up. I mean, there you could go on forever figuring out the research, but it's been really pretty fascinating. So I haven't gotten tired of it yet, and it's been a couple of years. So maybe one more question or If anybody is interested in writing, just 
Well, yeah, I feel like she persists really should be my, my action. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of unbelievable. And then even when the book comes out, you hope it, you hope it gets some review. This book came out April 4th. It was June 18th when the New York Times gave it a lovely half-page review. And I was thinking, really, New York Times? I spent so long on this book. And it did get the stars. And then it was so nice when I got a review. But there's so many books that come out. So you really have to. Um, make sure you enjoy things like speaking at schools and speaking at libraries and and uh, that's kind of part of writing a book too. And just one week ago, a kid wrote me a um, very short letter, I still won't read the whole thing, but it's, hi Carol, my name is Abby, I'm 14 years old, you probably get a lot of emails, so I'm kind of waiting for, you know, some horrendous thing and having to spend half an hour helping. But it was a fan email. And I said, but I wanted to tell you that I just finished Speed of Life and I thought it was really good. I don't like reading a lot, but I got this book for a project at school and I loved it. I relate to Sophia so much. Thank you so much for helping me realize that I love reading. Oh, you are a great writer. Please keep writing books like this. But you just feel like, wow, I, I'm, I want to be the gateway book, Roald Dahl in sixth grade, which is pretty late. I read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I'm like, this is pretty good. I wonder if there are any other good books in the world. <laughs> So, um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, if anyone is interested, we have books for sale as well as audio books for sale out in the exhibit uh, in the exhibition gallery. And Carol will sign books and perhaps maybe.